throughout the day are ways in which we can take our campaign forward. We have this tremendous uh, start now for, uh, of the ban treaty, which uh, we've been waiting for for a long time and people have worked for for a long time. And the reward for that was recognized at last by the Nobel um, Laureates uh, Committee, as you, as you know. So we have a real good kind of push to a start for something that can really be meaningful. And thank you for your insights, uh, Joseph, for what's going on in America, because we hear some, but not all, and um, what, what you, how you think you might take this forward. So, um, our next speaker is another person who was actually at uh, part of the Ban Treaty Talks in, in New York in the uh, United Nations. Uh, Caroline Lucas, also one of our Vice Presidents, of course, for a very long time, um, and has been campaigning for nuclear disarmament and peace for, well, ever since she's been an MP, even before. Even before she was an MEP, I think, as well. So, a brilliant campaigner, fantastic speaker, wonderful politician. What else can I say? Caroline Lucas. <laughs> Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. It feels a kind of high bar to, uh, to live up to now. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying what a pleasure it is to be here today and also to add my words to all of the tribute that have already been paid, both to ICANN, but, but crucially also to CND's role in that international coalition to ban nuclear weapons. And I think in a way that that Nobel Peace Prize feels like it's a prize, of course, for everybody at ICANN, first and foremost, but in a way, I think it's a, a prize for all of us, so many people all around the world who have had a vision for decades of a world free of nuclear weapons and have been prepared to devote a substantial amount of their lives to working for it. Um, as Dave mentioned, I was lucky enough to uh, go to New York and to... Um, to be there for some of the negotiations. And it just brought home to me the very obvious point, that the absence of our prime minister was such a reckless and criminal, and I use that word advisedly, criminal irresponsibility. I mean, how could she not even be there to observe? The idea that just by pretending this isn't happening, somehow that makes it go away, I just think is, is extraordinarily um, yeah. complacent and, and unforgivable, frankly. And I was so incensed when I saw that empty chair with the United Kingdom nameplate in front of it. I confess I did go and sit in front of it myself. <laughs> and, uh, and then <laughs> words back from the, from the British Embassy to say that it had not been appreciated. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so I joined CND well over 30 years ago. And for me, this seems to be such an extraordinary time that we're living through, and, and that's what I want to explore a little bit in my words this morning. Because on the one hand, undoubtedly, these are some of the most dangerous times that we have known. But at the same time, it just feels that we are also on the edge of something that could be quite transformatory and that transformational. And that, uh, that prize of, of ICANN, the fact of the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty, I think, are signals that we could be on the verge of something very, very positive and exciting too. So it really feels, friends, that we are, we are living in interesting times. I um, wanted to just remind you that, as obviously, that, that nine countries together possess around 15,000 nuclear weapons. And as you all know, a single nuclear warhead, if detonated on a large city, could kill millions of people with the effects persisting for decades, if not centuries. And we have the most powerful person in the world threatening nuclear war on Twitter. I mean, you could not make this up. The president of a country that spends more on its 7,000 more headstrong nuclear arsenal than all other countries combined. And also the only country to have ever used nuclear weapons in war. And Trump's inflammatory rhetoric and engagement in military exercises in and around Northeast Asia could, as we know, lead to the use of nuclear weapons either by intention or by miscalculation. And while we can't let North Korea off the hook, perhaps it is, in one sense at least, understandable that it wants to play catch-up, especially when developing its own nuclear capacity might feel to them at least integral to protecting its own security and its own very existence. 
Now, shockingly, the UK has refused to rule out the preemptive use of force in the region. It's refused even when such a reckless move could indicate to countries like China and India and Pakistan, which currently have a, a no first use policy, as well as to North Korea, that such action is somehow morally and practically acceptable. So our leaders are acting hugely dangerously. And as we know, disarmament is the only way to keep everyone safe. The stakes have always been high, but the US is more willing to gamble today than it has been for decades. And their response to the provocation from North Korea, Korea is taking us closer to the brink of nuclear conflict than we've been for decades. But Trump is more than just belligerent and bellicose. He also symbolizes that wave of intolerance and nationalism and racism that is washing over our world. A wave which spilled onto our streets of Britain, arguably under the cover of the EU referendum, that spilled onto the streets of Germany, where the far right won a higher share of the vote in recent elections than many expected, surging into third place with a, a campaign that opposed offering sanctuary to refugees, and onto the streets of countries like Nigeria, where ethno-nationalism is resurging once again and risks pitching families and friends against one another once again. And when Trump picks a fight with Kim Jong-un, he gives succor to the neo-Nazis <clears throat> rallying in Charlottesville or when he promises to build a wall on the Mexican border. He is validating that bullying and that hatred and that division. So what of our own country? Well, <clears throat> in many ways, our own prime minister is little better. She peddles hypocrisy every time she demands that other countries abandon nuclear weapons at the very same time as Britain insists on growing our own nuclear arsenal on replacing Trident nuclear weapons. And she follows in the footsteps of so many prime ministers who seem to forget that the Nuclear Weapons uh, Proliferation Treaty, sorry, the NPT, Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, get my acronyms right, but anyway, the NPT is made up of two parts of the bargain. And our prime ministers only ever remember the first part of the bargain, which is that those non-nuclear weapon states agree not to acquire nuclear weapons. The second half of the bargain, which is conveniently forgotten, is that those existing nuclear weapon states agree that they shall be, in good faith, making serious efforts to disarm. And how that is compatible with spending 180 billion and more on tragic nuclear weapons is frankly anyone's guess. And when you go and speak to the, uh, the, the government, when we went and saw the ambassador in, uh, in New York, and when we met with defense ministers here in the UK, somehow, they maintain that the nuclear ban treaty, that the weapons ban treaty that's just been negotiated in New York is somehow undermining the NPT, when in actual fact it is a way of putting the NPT into practice. It is precisely yeah. operationalizing yeah. all of the obligations that we have under the NPT. And you really do get this sense of, of black being white, of an Alice in Wonderland world, where words mean just whatever our our ministers um, see fit to, uh, to, to make them mean. Not only have we shown an utterly irresponsible response to that nuclear weapons ban treaty, we are also, as you know, rubbing shoulders with dictators and we deal arms with human rights abusers and then we express surprise when those arms are used. I mean, what do we expect? You know, what do we expect when we host the biggest arms fair in London, the biggest arms fair in the world happens in London, the Desi Arms Fair, and we are selling weapons to people that are on the UN human rights list of, of, of people who are abusing human rights. What do we expect? We are selling weapons to Syria, and then we express surprise that people in Yemen are being killed by those same weapons. The, 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 the double standards is, is, is quite extraordinary. And on that point, I just wanted to make one quick reference to the extraordinary work of a Professor Paul <coughs> Rogers, someone whose work I depend on hugely in, in, in Parliament, a Professor, as you will know, of Peace Studies in Bradford. And he regularly reminds us that Britain is at war. And we have been for the last three years over Syria and Iraq. And we're mainly, it's an air war with strike aircraft and armed drones. But it's at an intensity that has not been seen since the Gulf War of 1991. Again, it's a US-led coalition, and it's killed tens of thousands of people. And yet the connection between what is happening with those drone strikes and those airstrikes, and the terrible attacks that happen in London and Manchester and Paris and Nice and Istanbul, 
and Brussels and beyond, those connections are almost never made. And if they are ever made, then those of us making a connection are accused of somehow excusing what is happening, as if making a factual connection is somehow tantamount to justifying. Well, of course it is not, and nobody in their right mind would ever justify any of the most appalling attacks that happen here in Britain. But to pretend that they are not somehow related to a war that we are involved in, that is killing tens of thousands of people on a daily basis, but which is never in our news, I think is just irresponsible. And again, the UK is the second most significant country after the US. We're operating from our air bases at Akrotiri in, in Cyprus mainly, but also we're deploying drones from elsewhere. They're operated remotely from RAF Waddington, south of Lincoln. A Commons report in March of this year listed 3,000 missions flown, including 1,200 airstrikes. It's also likely that special forces are involved. But because this is a remote war, it's for most of us an invisible war. There are virtually no risks to military personnel. There are no body bags coming back. There are no processions through Wooten Bassett. And because of that, somehow, we pretend it's not happening. Well, friends, it is happening. And I think we need to remember that those actions, too, are not making the world a safer place. So from climate breakdown to the resource wars, which are just one of the many consequences of environmental degradation, from the increasing militarization to the 65 million people worldwide who've been forcibly displaced from their homes and are fleeing, among other things, conflict or political persecution, the future does, in many ways, look very dangerous and very bleak. But as I say, even in this bleakest of times, in some respects, I think hope feels like it is more resurgent, insurgent, if you like, now than it has been for a very long time. And hope not just as some woolly, warm feeling, but hope as defined by the wonderful author Rebecca Solnit, who refers to hope as being something very strong. It's something she says that you, it's like an axe that you break down doors with in an emergency. And that hope comes from the vision that we have and that we have always had of an overarching kind of way of seeing the world as we want to see it, a holistic vision which recognizes that the world's problems are interrelated, interconnected, and they can only be resolved when questions of equality and justice and sustainability and peace are understood as inextricably linked. That doesn't mean to say that we don't need to address all of the individual specific problems, the specific symptoms and specific solutions, but we do need to recognize that they are linked. And one link that I want to make just now, and I'm so pleased that, that, that CND does continually link, link, is between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And I'm so grateful for all of CND's support in the campaign to try to stop the building of Hinkley C nuclear power station. This is the biggest white elephant you can imagine. It's going to cost us 20 billion and more just in construction costs. And at a time when offshore wind, is, is falling in price by 50%. We are locking ourselves into paying double the wholesale price of electricity for the next 35 years. Nobody, but nobody, thinks this is a good economic deal. And in energy terms, nobody could possibly justify Hinkley C. It is just simply in any energy framework, utterly, utterly uh, unjustifiable. By the time it comes online, Renewables will be even cheaper, efficiency will be cheaper, battery storage will be much more effective, and so forth. And so, friends, the only way I think that we can explain the ideological obsession with nuclear with nuclear power is because of the cross subsidy between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Now, I know this is something that we have said for many years, but I've just been asking some some parliamentary questions just in the last few weeks, helped very much by Professor Andy Sterling at Sussex University. And now we're getting on the record, coming back from the government, the fact that they are conceding effectively that our heating bills are directly subsidizing nuclear weapons. Because the skills that they need for the nuclear weapons program are very similar to the skills that are needed for nuclear power. If we get rid of the nuclear power uh, program in this country, the government fears we will you lose the skills of, of, of the specialists who are also integral to nuclear weapons. So let us never forget that those two things are utterly interconnected. Yeah. But while we're making those connections, let's also 
make the connections, and again, CND have been doing a fantastic job of this, on the, on the huge amount of money that is being wasted on China, which should instead be spent on our NHS, or on our schools, or on our welfare system, a, a country that, that apparently cannot afford to pay basic support to people. The six weeks that people are being forced to wait now for universal <coughs> credit. How can we be the fifth biggest economy in the world and somehow not be able to afford basic human rights for our own population at the same time as we are spending yeah, yeah, 180 yeah, yeah. billion and more on trying to nuclear weapons? Yeah. <laughs> want to pay tribute to everybody uh, who is working so hard on this agenda and just I hope to to, to to make us feel hopeful as well and hopeful with a reason not not, not blindly hopeful but, but hopeful because I feel as if our movement is making gains now in a way that it hasn't done for, 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 for many re years recently that we're making allies in in new places and then as a peace movement we have a strong tradition of building common cause to defend shared values and to build the alternatives, both here and, and internationally. And at this conference in particular, we are celebrating our international links and recognizing that international solidarity is crucial to the success of our work for disarmament. And so I'm particularly delighted that we have our international guests here today. The challenges we face are global, and we will rise to them by working together collectively across borders as so clearly shown by the achievement of the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty and, of course, the Nobel Peace Prize. I said earlier that it feels as if the world is close to the brink of a nuclear strike, yet I believe we are also on the brink of something else, too. The brink of a future in which nuclear weapons are forever banished from the face of the Earth. And just as it feels, as I say, that we're at the most dangerous moment, we're also at the most exciting moment, and on that note, I just wanted to urge all of you, if you could uh, contact your MPs to do a couple of things. One is to sign Early Day Motion 374, which has just gone down in the last couple of days, which is calling on the government to get involved with the nuclear ban treaty process. It's not too late. In the EDM, we remind the government of the number of times they've said that they are in favor of multilateral nuclear disarmament. Every time we raise Trident, getting rid of Trident, they always say, <laughs> No, that's unilateral, we'll only do it multilaterally. Well, here, dear minister and dear prime minister, is a multilateral process that we might just like to get involved with. So EDM 374, please ask your MPs to get involved with that. And we are also seeking a debate with a vote in the House of Commons before Christmas. We don't have the date yet, but again, when we do, I know CND will be letting you know about that as well. And if you can urge your MPs to be at that debate, again, debating that nuclear ban treaty, that would be fantastic. The prospects for disarmament are here. Let's build on the opportunities that are present to secure a genuinely safe and secure future for us all. Let's take our alternative and our vision forward together, both nationally and crucially internationally as well. Thank you very much, Caroline. Okay, just. Uh... I'll be back shortly, guys. Thank you. Please tweeting. Keep tweeting this and sharing it on Facebook. Thank you.